Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you. I want to thank Chip for the invitation and, the, and that very kind introduction. And I want to thank all of you for coming to Washington, D.C. and getting involved in the process of debating these issues. As Americans, we all have a responsibility, responsibility to fight for what we believe in and make our voices heard. At a time when too many people are shouting others down and walking away from civil discourse, I want to thank you for joining the debate. I've had the opportunity to address a subset of the Federation in the past, and I'm always happy to be with you as hospitals play such a critical role in our nation's healthcare system. It will be critical that hospitals engage constructively as we work to, con to confront the unprecedented challenges our healthcare system faces. Hospitals must have a central role to play in the future, though that role may look a little different than it does today. That is a good thing, as innovation will create more efficient mechanisms of care delivery that build on the existing know-how, expertise, infrastructure, and employees of hospitals. I say this to stress that the administration sees hospitals as partners in our mission to reform American healthcare, building on the positive aspects of our current system. U.S. healthcare spending accounts to nearly 18% of gross domestic product, an outlier when compared with other developed nations that hover around 10 to 12%. And we have no improved outcomes to show for that extra money. It is imperative that change occur to address this spending disparity. I will focus today on three areas we have pri prioritized at the President's direction. Empowering patients, the value-based transformation of our healthcare system through choice and competition, and bringing down drug prices. On empowering patients, our current opaque pricing system fails to empower patients to control their own healthcare. To focus on an egregious example, surprise medical billing has gotten increasing attention as it has grown to be increasingly frustrating for the American people. Providers point fingers at payers, payers point fingers at providers, and the American people are left at the mercy of a cruel and indifferent process. In any other market, people expect to be told a price up front that they can agree to pay, negotiate down, or walk away from. The medical system too often takes advantage of people in the moments when they do not have any leverage. I'm thinking of patients charged multiples of cost for an emergency airlift, or someone who reasonably did not know to check if the anesthesiologist on shift was in network after confirming that the surgeon that would do their, their operation and hospital were in network. It is not acceptable to see institutions ostensibly committed to the mission of patient care profess helplessness when patients receive large bills from out-of-network physicians that they have expressly permitted to practice in their facility. It's not acceptable when these same institutions sell the right to airlift patients to companies sponsored by private equity firms who then send enormous bills to patients. Recently, I was in a discussion with a member of the United States Senate, and we were discussing a number of important issues. Suddenly, he went off topic. He grew animated when he discussed an incomprehensibly large bill and an incomprehensibly, uh, incomprehensible bill to him to understand for a grandchild's emergency room visit. He described how he began to sleuth out the source of the multi-thousand dollar visit to the emergency room, which probably involved an irate call to a CEO of a hospital or a health insurer. This was not a crazy senator. This is somebody that's been in the Senate for a long time and an active, sage voice on these issues. It has hit me personally as I have stared at medical charges for services that I know don't cost that much, and it hits members of our local communities. The point is that surprise medical bills have gotten the attention of the White House and the United States Congress, and something sooner or later needs to change. If hospitals, providers, and in issuers don't protect these patients from financial harm, Congress and the administration will need to act. 
We've heard a number of proposals ranging from arbitration to fixed rate setting to bundling, but we need an answer and we need your help. Caring for patients can't begin and end with attention to the clinical aspects of care. And you must agree, we need to provide information so patients can make informed decisions. We cannot tolerate a system where patients get taken advantage of financially any more than we can tolerate one where they are subject to substandard medical care. Another part of empowering patients is giving them freedom to choose the coverage that is right for them. I will never understand mandating one size fits all coverage for every American. But then again, I am not in favor of coercion over freedom. I believe in giving people freedom to choose. I believe in choices, and I believe in the power of competitive markets. That is why I'm incredibly proud to serve in an administration that opened up affordable freedom plans through short-term limited duration insurance and association health plans. A recent report found that 28 new AHPs have been created since the regulation to open up AHPs was finalized, and more are on the way. The Congressional Budget Office estimates these, estimates these plans will achieve premium savings of 30% and will lower premiums in the entire small group market through greater competition. Side by side with the exchanges, these plans aim to give Americans the choice and control they want, the affordability they need, and the quality they deserve. Freedom from coercion is also the key reason why the Trump administration eliminated the individual mandate penalty. And this past fall, the administration proposed new options for employers and employees by proposing to expand health reimbursement arrangements through administrative action. The exchanges are still out there with all their mandates and coverage requirements. They serve as an option. They shouldn't be the only choice, however. But this is not how everyone sees it. There are those out there who want to take away choices from the American people and aren't content with the mandates of the ACA. The Medicare for All single payer plan introduced in the House of Representatives, would, which would ban private insurance, can be broken down into three core components. One, centralized control that will dictate pricing, utilization management, and minimum service levels beyond which there will be little incentive to improve. Two, deeper government regulation to define rules and standards that limit the basis of competition and continue to encourage consolidation. Third, one size fits all. Benefits that spread spend indiscriminately across the population and will not improve affordability. In contrast, if I were to lay out a system we believe in and we believe in as an administration, our three points would be one, empowering patients to choose what is best for them, create downward price pressure, control unnecessarily utilization, and improve service levels. Two, ensuring government policies promote value, encourage competition, and unleash, unleash innovation. And third, Recognizing that people are different and that some Americans, through no fault of their own, have to confront pre-existing conditions. They should be taken care of. But no one, including our government, should be bankrupted by the healthcare system. To be perfectly frank about this, the Medicare for All plan goes in exactly the wrong direction. More regulation, more centralized control, one size fits all, designed by a distant elite group of super regulators. We need to empower patients, promote choice and competition, and take care of people who truly need it because we are a compassionate, caring society. Compassionate and caring, however, does not mean divorce from reality. Central planning doesn't work. The centrally planned government-designed exchange subsidies haven't delivered, as an example. Per the Congressional Budget Office, we now spend more than $50 billion per year on subsidies in the Obamacare individual marketplace. This annual cost has led to an increase of from 10.6 million enrollees in the individual market in 2013, before the ACA subsidies kicked in, 
to 14.4 million enrollees in the first quarter of 2018. 50 billion dollars for an improvement of less than 4 million enrollees. This is not progress. I remain a skeptic of complicated models designed to drive value, and I believe the only way to drive a value-based transformation in our, into our healthcare system is through choice and competition. Our delivery system should be incentivized to deliver the best outcomes for patients in the most efficient manner possible. It is no surprise that we aren't meeting that standard given the way Medicare reimbursement works. The Kaiser Family Foundation found that hospital admissions for several common preventable diseases are more frequent in the United States than in comparable countries. As hospital admissions are expensive and take people away from other things they would rather be doing, this is not an area we, shouldn't, we should lead on. But it does make sense that we are in this state. Our traditional fee-for-service structure pays providers for performing services and focusing on codes rather than for improving health. As a result, providers perform a lot of unnecessary services and spend too much time recording them to ensure they will be reimbursed. Our doctors and nurses are focused on iPads and computer screens when they should be focused on the patient. Government payment policies <laughs> government payment policies have also contributed to higher costs in both Medicare and commercial insurance by encouraging consolidation among hospitals, among physician practices, and between hospitals and physician practices. The first two forms of consolidation have spurred increased market power to demand higher prices from commercial insurance and a growing disparity between Medicare and commercial payment rates. The consolidation between hospitals and physician practices increased prices for both commercial and Medicare physician services. More than 40% of physicians are now employed at hospitals, a market increase over the roughly one quarter of physicians in 2012. Commercial insurance price increases due to this market power, due to this market power continue to increase. Medicare spends more because it generally pays a higher fee for a service provided by a hospital-owned physician service than it would for the same service in an independent doctor's office. Medicare paid an estimated $1.6 billion more for physician visits in 2015 than it would have if the payment rates for all visits were the same as those in independent doctor's offices. This increase is not only Medicare spending, but seniors out of pocket costs, and they're spending, as the, uh, and they're spending on coinsurance and copays. It contributes to future increases in Part B premiums as well. Providers and systems willing to be paid based on the quality of care they deliver rather than the services they perform should be freed from the reporting burdens necessitated by our current structure, and we can break the cycle of these terrible incentives. We have been working to change the current system through efforts like CMS Administrator Seema Verma's Patients Over Paperwork Initiative, which has decreased the hours and dollars clinicians and providers spend on CMS-mandated compliance and increased the proportion of tasks that CMS customers can do in a completely digital way. We further simplified things with the first overhaul of the documentation and coding requirements for physician's evaluation and management visits in 20 years. How much better would it be if incentives were focused on keeping people healthy and out of the hospital? By partnering with hospital groups to eliminate unhelpful regulations and shift to a system when patients are taken care of holistically, we aim to place U.S. healthcare spending on a more sustainable trajectory. We are committed to pursuing rulemaking to implement the reform, reforms called for in the December report on reforming, Amer reforming America's healthcare system through choice and competition. These reforms include specific recommendations regarding the benefits of telehealth and streamlining quality measurement programs, among other areas. The reforms will often be deregulatory, recognizing that it is distortions introduced by the federal government's payment and regulatory policies that created the anti-competitive nature of our current system. These reforms will initiate long overdue changes in the way the healthcare industry operates, and we hope you will partner with the administration 
Congress, and state policymakers in transforming the way we reimburse and regulate our healthcare system. As this report was issued in response to one of the most critical executive orders the President has signed in the health space, you can rest assured implementing its recommendations is one of our highest priorities. And on the drug pricing front, we are committed to delivering on the President's promise to lower drug prices for American patients. And I want to be clear about the goals of this administration. We are interested in real, lasting structural reforms. Over the last decade, we have seen the growth of significant problems in Medicare Part B and Part D programs. From 2009 to 2017, spending in Medicare Part B grew at roughly 6% per year. In Part D, we're growing at 9.5% per year. These costs impact patients, particularly patients that use the programs the most. That is why, as an administration, we are committed to lowering list prices, lowering patient out-of-pocket costs, and improving, or in some cases, introducing more negotiation and competition into these programs. We also note with concern that the use of the 340B discount program has expanded beyond its original purpose of helping hospitals and facilities serving the most vulnerable members of our society. From 2005, to 2018, we've seen 340B drug sales increase from $2.4 billion to over $19 billion. This kind of growth suggests that not all of the money is being used to benefit patients, and hospitals end up profiting from those discounts through higher reimbursements, reimbursement rates for Medicare. There are too many distortions, too many games being played, and too much money getting sucked out of the pockets of American patients and taxpayers without fair value. It has to stop. I know you will be hearing from Administrator Verma later today on our efforts to promote interoperability in addition to the topics I touched on this morning. The changes HHS has proposed are critical, and I stand in lockstep with the Administrator and HHS in implementing them. Working together to empower patients transform the delivery system to deliver value and lower drug prices, we can help give Americans the choice and control they want, the affordability they need, and the quality they deserve. This is not only good policy or good business practice, it is our duty to our communities and the American people as leaders in our healthcare system. America's hospitals don't play just an important role in American healthcare. They play a sacred role in American life, bringing new lives into the world, repairing bodies that are critically injured, and caring for those struggling at the end of life's journey. On behalf of the Trump administration, I am asking the Federation of American Hospitals to partner with us as we work on reforms to improve the American healthcare system. Thank you.